Welcome to Celebration. Thank you for joining us. I'm especially glad you joined us today for a couple of reasons. I'm always glad when you join us to look into God's Word. But we're starting a new series today, so you get in on the right at the beginning of it, and you can stay with us the whole time. I'm calling the series For Such a Time as This. Now, many of you probably recognize that. Well, that comes from the book of Esther, and we're going to look at that story in a little bit. Uh, but there are many times. Uh, I think the one that we're going to look at here in Esther really is about a time to get involved. So that's uh, our title for today's message. Our series is about for other times as well. And I think if you'll stay with us as we go through those, that God continually places us in times or eras or just even circumstances uh, that we are there for a specific reason. And we are there for such a time as that or for such a condition as that or to talk to such a person as that. And so uh, we're going to look at some of those over the next several weeks. So I hope you'll stay with us. Uh, but we're going to look into the book of Esther today and uh, talk about a time to get involved, that Esther was there for this time that she needed to make the decision to get involved. Sure, if you know the story, she was there to save God's people, but to do that, she had to get involved and make that decision. So in a little bit, we're going to read from chapter 4, just a few verses, when we get to the context where this title phrase comes from, for such a time as this. But let me just uh, remind some of you or inform some others who may not be familiar with the story of Esther and get you caught up to where this event took place. So you probably remember that there didn't used to be a Jewish nation. There was no Israel, and God sort of created Israel by choosing Abraham and Sarah, a couple. And in their old age, he miraculously helped them to have a child. And he said that, I'm going to bless you and your descendants. And so from this child Isaac, there were sons, and then they had sons, and eventually uh, they grew into a family clan. And maybe you know the story how God protected them in Egypt, and they continued to grow. But God had made the covenant with Abraham to say that uh, he would bless Abraham, and his people would be greater than the sands of the sea in terms of number that uh, he would bless people who blessed them and curse those who cursed them. And eventually the whole world would be blessed through Abraham's seed. And so he created the nation Israel, from which, of course, we get the uh, human existence, the incarnation of the Son of God, when Jesus was born into this family of people, the Israelites. And so that's how the whole world has been blessed. The problem is that over time these people forgot about God. And he was continually having to bring them back and, and use prophets and the laws and everything else to try to keep them dedicated to him. But they continued generation after generation to go after other gods, false gods and idols from like the people around them. Well, eventually, as always is going to be the case, God finally has to have judgment. And so he allowed uh, the split kingdom now, the northern kingdom was Israel, and God allowed the Assyrians to come in and conquer them. The southern kingdom was Judah, which included Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, the temple of Jerusalem, uh, all of Judah and Judea you're familiar with. And they lasted a little bit longer, but eventually Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in and they sacked Jerusalem. They tore down the walls, they tore down the, the temple. A lot of people were killed and some of those people were deported uh, back to Babylon. And that's where you get the stories about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and even Esther in our story today, all took place in exile over in the Babylonian area. Now, the Babylonians had to give way to the Medes and the Persians. They conquered the Babylonians. So by the time we get to Esther's story, which is the whole book of Esther, uh, it's under Persian rule. And Ahasuerus is the king. And his queen Vashti is on the throne, and uh, he rules with an iron fist over this land. Among those exiles I talked about was a man named Mordecai, a Jew named Mordecai, who was a cousin to this young girl named Esther. Uh, Esther was orphaned during some of these battles, and so Mordecai adopted his cousin Esther as a child and raised her as his own daughter. Uh, the Bible tells us that Esther had a, grew to have a nice figure and was very beautiful. And you say, well, what difference does that make? <laughs> it's going to come into play in a little bit. So Mordecai raised Esther as his own. And Ahasuerus is the ruling authority there, the king. 
So in his third year of reign, he threw this wild big party and he gathered all of his governors and satraps and dignitaries and heads of state from other places and they called them all to the palace and, and he had this big, big party. Vashti had one for the women in another area. And they drank the wine and Hazarus said, you know, keep it coming, keep it flowing. There's no limits. We're just having a big time here showing off his kingdom and his riches and his power. And at some point, when they've all been drinking for days, he decided to bring Vashti into all these men uh, because she was so beautiful. He wanted to just show her off and parade her around. When she found that out, uh, she refused to go. She didn't want to be put on the stand. You and I today would say, hey, good for her taking a stand like that. But in her day, you didn't say no to the king ever. So he asked around for a little bit of counsel, and the consensus was she can't be queen anymore. Uh, all the women will take a note from her, and there'll be total disruption all over the territory. And so he banished her, and she was no longer the queen. And uh, it took him a little while to get over his hurt and his anger, but eventually he realized, i got to have another queen. So they sent out the word, and they gathered all of the uh, best-looking young ladies in the whole province. Esther was one of those who, as we already said, because of her looks, she was brought to the palace. Uh, they were put under the charge of uh, various uh, eunuchs and people in charge of the harems and such. There were who knows how many of these young ladies brought and uh, worked with. And they were going to have about a year's time before they would finally be ready to show themselves to the king and let him choose a new queen. Mordecai advised Esther not to reveal that she was Jewish. There was a lot of hatred still for the Jewish people, a lot of discrimination and such, and he said, do not tell them that you're Jewish. Just go along with the rules, go along with the practice, see what happens. Well, she immediately gained favor with the man in charge of her part, and uh, he began to uh, give her extra attention. They were to get manicures, pedicures, shampoos, oil baths, uh, massages, all kinds of things to help them develop and, and taught how to behave and, and manners and grace so that they could be fit to be queen someday and he gave her all the extra attention and all the, the resources he could and so sure enough one day Esther was presented to the king and he immediately fell for her loved her above all the rest of them and made her the queen Esther is the new queen but nobody knows she's Jewish in the process of this, Mordecai would go by every day and go to the gate and he would check on Esther as best he could and see how she was progressing. And in one of those occasions, he overheard two of the guardsmen plot against the king. They were going to assassinate the king and overthrow the government. So he got word to Esther who got word to the king and he caught these guys and had them killed. And he wrote down in the book of records that Mordecai the Jew had saved his life. Now, he didn't do anything to repay him, but it was written down in the records. Uh, at this same time, one of the king's men named Haman uh, was currying the king's favor, and the king rose him to power and eventually made him number two in the nation. He put his signet ring on him so that he would have the power to make some laws and do some things in the king's name. And uh, he rode the territory on a fancy horse in fancy clothes, and, and everybody was to acknowledge that he's the number two man and uh, give him glory and honor and, and respect. But Mordecai would not do that. Uh, Haman hated the Jews, and with Mordecai's reaction, he hated them even more, and he certainly hated Mordecai, and he decided that he's got to get rid of these people. Mordecai would never bow down. He would never acknowledge Haman, and every time the two met, it just ate at, at Haman, and he couldn't stand it. So he went to the king and he began to talk to him about this ethnic group that's out there that pay him no mind, that have their own mindset and do whatever they want. And so the king gave him permission and, and passed a law that on a certain month, at a certain day, Haman and the guardsmen and the, and the armies were going to go out and destroy all the Jews that they could find. When Mordecai heard this, he went for Esther. And he sent a messenger to Esther with this plea for help and said that you need to go before the king and plead for your people. It's time to reveal who you are, that you're Jewish, and these are your people that are going to be destroyed. Even you could be destroyed, and you need to go talk to him. But Esther said, I, I can't. If You can't just go to the king. He has to hold out his scepter when he sees you to accept you or reject you, and I could be killed for this. And so that brings us to our verses where uh, in chapter 4, where Mordecai said, says Mordecai told the messenger to reply to Esther, don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. 
So in other words, he's saying, you're, you're not going to get away with this. Don't think about it. Verse 14, if you keep silent at this time, liberation and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's house will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Well, Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, day or night. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. And so she has decided that she has to get involved. That's the point of our message today is for such a time as this, it was a time to get involved. And I think if there's ever been a time among God's people today, among the church today, that we need to get involved, it's today. Because there's so much going on around us. There's so much in our culture that's negative. There's so much... Uh, false information. I hate to even call it that. It's just lies, but not everybody understands they're passing on lies. So for them, it's information. It just happens to be false. And I'm not just talking about the pandemic. I'm talking about everything you can think of. People just hear things, say things, repeat things, post it on social media. We can't trust the government. We can't trust the medical profession. We can't trust each other. Uh, people are telling me you can't trust the church. They're saying you can't trust the Word of God. People are afraid. People uh, don't have knowledge themselves and can't trust where they're getting it. It's time that those of us who believe in God and trust the Bible to be the Word of God get involved. And so by looking at Mordecai a little bit and Esther specifically, we get some ideas here about how and why we should get involved. First of all, let's look at godly purposes. We'll finish the story in a little bit, but we need to lay down these principles. That we're talking about getting involved in godly purposes, not just getting involved somewhere. Gracious, you can get involved in sports, you can get involved in the school program, you can get involved in politics, you get involved at work. And I'm not saying any of these things are bad, but they are not our real purpose. Even family is only our purpose as we lead them to Christ and lead them in our godly relationships. And so godly purposes, Mordecai understood this. And he gradually got Esther to understand that, that the right purposes to be involved in are based on spiritual needs, not just physical. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God and his purposes. And his purpose is to win people and reconcile them back to him and to help us to be like Jesus. So any purpose or any activity that we could get involved in that helps us help build spirituality in people based on scriptures, that's a godly purpose. Not the physical things, not even self-esteem matters, not even uh, be the best you can be. No, be the best God can have you be based on spiritual matters. And so Mordecai brought Esther up that way. And then he said, who knows, but what, this is why you're in this position for a godly purpose, not to just be a good ruler, not to be a good wife to the king, not even to, you know, tip your hat to your own people, but to actually save them based on spiritual things. So it's beyond self. Since it's not about me, I've got to get out of my comfort zone. I've got to get out of my goals and dreams and seek godly purposes. Those are the things to get involved in. Yes, you need a career. So maybe you need an education or get a trade. You need to have a good work ethic. All of those things are fine. You need to take care of your family. You need to help take care of others. But you need godly purposes and you need his designs and his plans so get beyond yourself and then Mordecai also understood and finally Esther did as well that godly purposes are built with sacrifice we've talked about it before we talked about it just a couple of messages ago from Romans chapter 12 where where Paul said based on everything God has done for you present yourselves as a living sacrifice there are people right now as we speak around this world, sacrificing their lives for the cause of Christ, for godly purposes. In America, we gripe and complain if it just takes too much time or the church building is too cold or it's too hot or it's, the seats are not comfortable or the preacher preaches too long or whatever. Uh, we don't hardly know the meaning of sacrifice, but godly purposes will bring us to that. And so we need to understand that. When I say you've 
been placed where you are for such a time as this, a time to get involved. I'm talking about getting involved in God's business, godly purposes. Jesus said it when he first started preaching the kingdom on the Sermon on the Mount, when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The things he was talking about were uh, shelter and food and clothing and, and all the physical things. He said those will be added, but your job is to seek first God's purposes. Well, then we look at God's preparations. That should help us. Uh, all the planning that went into this. God knew way ahead of time. Now, if you're sharp on the book of Esther, you already know that God's name is not mentioned in the book at all. But you also should know that if you know the rest of the Bible, this is exactly what God's doing, and it has to be God. It just wasn't written that way. But God was ahead of time planning. You think it's a coincidence that Esther, a Jew, is the queen at this time? When the Jewish people are about to be annihilated and God has promised all along, no, they're not going to be. You're not going to foil my plan. You see, I've already planned. And I've already caused Mordecai to raise Esther as his own. I've already caused Mordecai to instill in her the principles that would work here. And so God worked way ahead of time as he planned it and built these principles into the lifestyle and into the, uh, the religious faith of these people. And now he's going to provide the power for Esther to do what she's supposed to do. God has been preparing her all of her life for this very moment. He prepared Mordecai ahead of her. He's prepared her since the beginning. You do not catch God off guard. Do you think for a moment that the one who created the universe, that could speak it into existence, that has done the miracles throughout the Bible, do you think he was caught off guard by a pandemic last year? Do you think he didn't know that was coming? Do you think he didn't know about the laws and the uh, mandates that were going to go out about who, how many people could worship and how many people could gather? Do you think he doesn't know about the disease and how it works and how we ought to be prepared and, and what our purpose in all of this is about? Of course he does. He's all-knowing. He's not bound by time. He already knows how it's going to play out in the end. God has prepared circumstances. He has prepared your life. He has prepared your heart. He has built you in a particular way with all of your character, your mind, your education, your opportunities, your background, all the things that have gone into making you who you are. He has put those together despite our mistakes and sins. He's put us together and put us in this very place, in this very time to get involved because he's in the people business, and we're losing ground with people. We can't even keep up with the birth rate, the physical birth rate, compared to the spiritual birth rate. We're falling behind. But more importantly even than that is that those of us who know God and have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ, we're not doing the work. We're not getting involved. And the average church, only 20% of the people are the ones doing all the work and providing most of the money. God didn't plan it that way. He planned for us all, and he's called all of us to be involved in ministry. And you're here for that reason. And I want to challenge you to think about that. Think about your standing with the local church. Where are you affiliated? Who are you working with to be working for God? God has prepared you, but are you following through? And so we not only have uh, the godly purposes that he wants you to begin to fulfill, but he's prepared you for it. And so it's up to you now to have what I call the grand participation. Esther, first of all, acknowledged her reality. She realized that Mordecai was speaking the truth. She's Jewish. They're going to find that out. If the Jews get killed, she's going down. If she's going to help at all, they'll have to find out why. She acknowledged, I'm Jewish. These are my people. This is my family. And I can't stand idly by and enjoy the palace and have my good food and have my good clothes and fancy clothes and have my prestige and my power and my fame while God's people suffer. And then she accepted her role. She said, I will go to the king. And she did. 
And the king held out his scepter and accepted her because he loved her. And he brought her in and he says, what, what are you up to? What can I do for you? Uh, I'll do whatever I can for you. And, and he said, in fact, I'll give you half of my kingdom. Uh, what do you want? Well, let me finish the story. And then I'll come back. Half the kingdom, that's not what she wanted. She said, what I want to do is give a banquet. And I want you and Haman to come to the banquet. And others, leaders. And uh, he said, that's it. Huh? Okay, I'll do that for you. Well, Haman is uh, thrilled with this, and uh, he uh, goes home to, went home to his wife, uh, but in the meantime, faces Mordecai one more time, and Mordecai just will not give him respect and will not bow down. And so he went home, and he said, now, here we are, we're at a banquet, and uh, Esther has said that what she wants now is to have a second banquet. And she, he says, I've been invited, me and the king, we're going to this other banquet with the queen. And he said, and none of it means anything because Mordecai, the Jew, disrespects me and will never bow down. And his wife said, well, why don't you just go build a gallows about 75 feet high? And his sons were in on it too and said, just hang Mordecai where everybody can see it. And then everybody else will take heed and bow down. He thought that sounded pretty good. So he proceeded to get this gallows built. The king, on the other hand, couldn't get to sleep after the first banquet and he waiting on the second one. He couldn't sleep that night, so he brought in a man to read from him the book of the uh, records. I guess when you're king, you don't have to read for yourself. You've got people to do that. So he brings in a guy to read for him, and he reads the part where Mordecai saved the king. And the king said, well, remind me, what was, what was done for this guy? And he said, nothing. He said, well, that's got to change. He said, I need a little advice here. He said, is, is there somebody in the courtyard that can help me? And he said, Haman's out there hanging around. So he brought in Haman, and he didn't tell him who, but he said, what should be done for the guy who, who is, uh, the king owes much to? He, he has uh, done so much for me and, and uh, has sacrificed for me, and, and I, I really want to repay him and do something for him. What should I do? Well, Haman, with his big ego, thinks he's talking about Haman. And so he lays it on and says, oh, I think you should get a, one of your own suits of clothing and give it to him. And everybody will know, that, hey, that's the king's clothes. And uh, put a crown on him and, and get a horse that only the king has ridden and give that to him and, and let him get on this horse that everybody knows is the king's horse and let him parade through the capital city of Susa and everybody will see how great he is and, and this honor greatly bestowed on him by the king. And he thinks all along that this is him. And so then the king says, that sounds great. He says, I'm going to put you in charge of this. Go out and get Mordecai the Jew because he saved the king's life and do these very things for him. Can you imagine what that did to Haman? Uh, he didn't know what to do. And uh, so, uh, he, but he had to do it. <laughs> the king, you know, you can't dispel the king. So he took care of that business. Sad as it might be. And then it was time the next day for banquet number two. And the king asked Esther again, what do you want from me? What can I do for you? Up to half of my kingdom, I'll give you. And she said, I need your help. I'm Jewish. And my people, you've signed a decree that my people on a certain day and time are going to be destroyed. They're going to be killed. My family, perhaps even me because I'm Jewish. And the king said, who has done such a thing? He didn't realize he had signed the law or whatever, but she pointed to Haman. And she said that evil Haman is the one who's done that. And even now has a 75-foot gallows designed to hang this very Mordecai because of his treatment. Well, the king was furious and uh, left the, the room, went out on the balcony to sort through his feelings and, and what he needed to do. Haman knew he was finished. He's in trouble. And he began to beg Esther for his life and for his position. Uh, Esther was reclining on a couch there, and Haman was so distraught that he threw himself down on the couch, and, and he began to beg. And just then, Ahasuerus came back in, and he saw Haman lying on Esther's couch with her sitting there beside him. And he thought the worst. And he said, what are you doing? He said, you dared defile my wife in her own chambers in, uh, here in the palace. And Haman couldn't even explain. Uh, he was so distraught. And the king had him taken out and hung on his own gallows. Esther continued her plea for the people. And uh, the king said, there's nothing I can do. I can't change an edict like that. 
And uh, together they devised a plan that would help her people. What he could do was make a new law. And he did that. And what he said was that the Jews could get advance warning and they would know what's going to happen. And they would be able to arm themselves and defend themselves and fight for their lives. That was the best that he could do. Well, they were able to do that. They defended themselves and they conquered uh, the enemy there. And they were saved. Not every single individual, but as a nation, as a people. Esther was able to be uh, totally instrumental in saving her people. And so that's achieving the right results. Because she acknowledged the situation she was in and accepted her role in that, because she got involved, she achieved the right results. In her case, yes, it was save her people. In your case, I don't know. It depends on what God's calling you to do, how he's calling you to get involved. Maybe it's uh, teach a class. Maybe it's join the ministry as a vocation. Maybe he was calling you to be a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary. Uh, maybe he's asking you to take over the children's ministry or the youth ministry or, or the uh, uh, kitchen help. Uh, maybe to get involved uh, teaching a class, sitting in the nursery, uh, playing on the praise team. I don't know. I mean, there's a myriad of things here. And they're, they're going to change over time because God's not done with us. As long as you're here, he's still calling you to get involved in different activities, different ministries, different lives. And you need to acknowledge the reality of the fact that you were made by God for God. And we were created to do good works, godly works. So we need to define those works, find out what God is up to, and join him. Uh, so much of our prayers and our ministries and our churches are involved in setting an agenda and then asking God to come and bless it and help us work it out. It's supposed to be the other way around. We exist for Him and His glory. We should say, God, what do you want? What do you want us to be involved in? What do you want us to do? And how do you want us to do it? And as He reveals that through His Word and through His Holy Spirit that dwells in us, through His church, we can surrender to that and, say, and accept that role and say, you know what? I'm here for a time like this. In a time when the world is going to pot. In a time when Christianity is uh, trying to be annihilated. In a time where even the church sits back. I've been talking to pastors recently and hearing that because of the pandemic and the shutdown last year and the people being slow to be able to get back to worship, back to Bible study, back to business as usual, so to speak, that many of them have become complacent. And now that they can do things, they just don't want to. They don't want to get involved. And yet God is saying through Esther to us, I put you here in this pandemic, in this church, in this place, in this nation for such a time as this, for such a time as to you, for you to get involved in the lives of my people and my future people, whether it's teaching, praying, doing ministry, doing missions, or all of the above, I don't know, for you. But I know that God has saved you for his purposes. And he's empowered you for his purposes. You just need to acknowledge that, accept your role, and I promise you God will help you achieve the right results. Because you're doing his purposes. He's prepared you for this. Will you surrender to that? Will you give in to his calling like Esther did? Will you realize that you should do what God wants you to do? And if it kills you, literally. If I perish, I perish, she said. If the king takes my life, at least I will have died trying to fulfill God's purposes in my life. Of course, that didn't happen because God needed her to do that. He doesn't really need her. He doesn't really need me. He doesn't really need you, but he's chosen to use us. And so he's called you and he's equipping you and he needs you to say, I'll do it. I'll get involved and let God work out the details. Just like Esther, you've been made for this very time, this very year, the very circumstance that you're in. Will you give in to that and serve God? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that you are a God in charge. You never slip up. Nothing ever sneaks up on you. You know it all and you can do it all. You've chosen to be in a relationship with us. And in that relationship, call us to your work. God, help us see that, accept that, 
and do that. For Jesus' sake and for the kingdom's sake. In his name we pray. Amen.